Hi, and welcome to lecture five. In this lecture, we are going to talk about estimating reliability coefficients. This will extend what we learned in lecture four, where we learned the conceptual definitions of reliability. Now, you might recall from that lecture that we had four different ways to really think about what reliability means. Let's review those now. First of all, the definition of reliability is often taken as the proportion of variance in the observed scores that's due to variability among the true scores. So we write it as that fraction, sigma squared t over sigma squared x. Now, of course, as a proportion, that, that number can never be larger than one, right? Perfect reliability would be a 100% or a reliability coefficient of one. The second way to think about reliability is we can think about it as the square of the correlation between the observed and the true scores. So it's not just the correlation itself, but it's rather the square of it. The third way we can think about reliability is to focus on the error variability and consider reliability as what's left over after we remove that error variability. That is one minus that fraction of error variance over the total observed variance. And then finally, uh, to go back to the correlation idea, we can think about reliability as the lack of correlation between the observed and error scores. It's one minus the squared correlation between those two quantities. So these are four equivalent ways to think about the number that represents reliability. But this leaves one very, very important question that we're going to address today. And that is that these ideas of reliability are based on theoretical concepts, right? This idea of this hidden true score and error score that we can compose every observed score as. That's the underpinning of classical test theory. So given that these are all theoretical, one immediately has to wonder, how do I actually compute reliability when all I have is a set of observed measurements? Well, that's what we're gonna start thinking about today. Today, we're going to discuss how to use what are called parallel forms to compute these reliability coefficients. Now, this is sometimes referred to as split half reliability, and you'll see why in just a few seconds. Now, today I want to focus on three different types of computations that we can do in this spirit of using parallel forms. The first of these is where we take a test and we split it into two parallel halves and compute the correlation between those halves. This is called the Spearman-Brown formula that we're going to develop in a few moments. This is the formal notion of split half reliability, if you see that written in the literature. The second kind of thing that we're going to focus on today is what happens if the halves are not parallel. So I've been using this word parallel a lot, but I haven't actually defined it yet, so we'll do that in a second. But if they're not parallel, as it turns out, it's actually quite hard to be parallel forms, we can still estimate the reliability coefficient using something called Cronbach's alpha. So we'll define what that is and show how to use it shortly. And then the last thing that we'll consider is not just splitting tests into two halves, whether they be parallel or not, but rather splitting them into multiple subtests. In fact, all the way down to the item level. And this will give rise to something called the generalized Spearman-Brown formula and the generalized version of Cronbach's alpha. It turns out that these are very useful. In fact, implicitly, these are what are used more often than anything. So that'll be the last thing that we talk about today. So let's talk about this first method uh, at the beginning. Let's talk about what happens when we split our test into parallel halves. So just for some notation, let's call our test X, and we'll let the parallel halves be Y and Y prime. Okay, now what does this mean? Well, parallel tests are tests that have the same underlying true scores and they have the same variance. Okay, so that's what it means to be parallel. So basically, think of a test, you know, consider, uh, consider the test as having, let's just say, for example, 20 items. Okay, I'm just pulling that number out of the air. Let's say that you could break that test into such a way that you could split it into a test of 10 and a test of 10, and that these two tests would have the same underlying true score as the total and would have the same variance as each other. So that's what we would mean by having parallel tests. That's actually quite a hard thing to do. But oftentimes when we're thinking uh, mathematically, we think, well, let's just simplify things as much as possible. So that's what we're doing with this assumption. 
So let's do some math. Let's see how the math works out to help us compute reliability. So if these are two parallel halves, we can start by writing x as y plus y prime. Literally, x is a composite of two tests. Now we know from our work back in unit uh, two or three, I've already forgotten which one now, I think it was lecture three actually. We know from our work in lecture three that we can write the variance of a composite as the sum of the two components variances, so sigma squared y and sigma squared y prime, plus two times the covariance between those two components. Now, we also know that the covariance can be written slightly different in terms of the correlation and the standard deviation. So let's do that now. So I'm going to replace this two times the covariance with two times the correlation between y and y prime times the product of the standard deviations of y and y prime. Okay, so there's nothing new here. This is just using the, the math that we learned in lecture three. Now let's actually use this assumption that the tests are parallel. What does parallel give us? Well, parallel gives us by definition that the two forms have the same variance. So that means that sigma y prime is the same as sigma y. Now there's a lot of those things floating around up here. If we replace each occurrence of sigma squared y prime and sigma y prime with sigma squared y and sigma y respectively, we get this. So you can see what I've done here is I've just rewritten this expression, but I've plugged in, instead of the y primes, I've just plugged in what they're equivalent to, which is just sigma squared y. Now, why do this? Well, we, we do this because things really start to simplify now. Think about this. Um, these two are the same term, so they can combine. These two are the same term, so they can combine multiplying into squares. So we would get something like this. This gives us two sigma y squareds. And this gives us a sigma y squared here. And now at this point, I can factor out a two sigma y squared out of this expression to be left with this expression. Two sigma y squared times quantity one plus the correlation between y and y prime. Okay. All right, that, that doesn't seem very simple. You gotta you got stay with me here, but we're, we're gonna use this in just a second. Now I'm gonna take a step aside and do a different computation. Remember, Reliability is all about the proportion of true score variance to the proportion uh, uh, compared to total variance, right? So we need to know something about the true score variance here. So let's do that. Let's consider the true score variance for x, and we're going to denote that t sub x. Then what do we get? Well, we can do the same thing, the same sort of writing the composite trick, uh, just like before. We take the total variance of those true scores, it's going to be the variance of the true scores coming from y plus the variance of the true scores coming from y prime plus two times the covariance of those, which I can then rewrite using correlation this way. Okay, so this is the same trick we did just a minute ago. Again, let's use parallel forms to help us with these y primes that we see. So parallel is going to give us a couple of things. First of all, it's going to give us that the variances are the same. And the other thing that it's going to give us is that the correlation between the true scores for y and y prime is equal to 1. They are perfectly correlated. And here's why. It's because by assumption in parallel forms, the true scores for each subject have to be equal on both parallel forms. The underlying true scores are the same. If they are the same, then correlating their collection is going to be a perfect correlation. It's going to give you a correlation coefficient of 1. Now that's really nice because that means that this term right here is going to go away. It's just going to be equal to 1. And we're going to get some simplification. Let's work through the math in that simplification. So again, let's start with the original expression that we just had. So the variance, the true score variance is there. We wrote it as a composite. Now these parts right here, we're going to use these little implications from classical test theory and from parallelness to simplify them. Specifically, they're going to get replaced this way. I can write the variance of ty prime as just the variance of ty. I can write this correlation as just 1, and I can write this standard deviation as a standard deviation in ty. Now, what does this give us? Well, if we collect some like terms, this gives us one of these guys, one of these guys, and then this multiplied together is another one of these guys. I've got one of them plus two of them 
plus two more, that gives me a total of four sigma squared ty. Okay, so why did we do all that? Well, because now we have two components, this and this thing up above, that are going to build our correlation coefficient for us. Or sorry, our reliability coefficient. How does that work? Well, reliability, by definition, is just the proportion of true score variance, Tx, over the total variance, x. And we have expressions for these. We just saw that this was equal to that four times something, and this was the one we did before. So as a fraction, we get something like that, four sigma squared Ty over that. Now, what can we do with this? Well, we can um, take some things out here, first of all. We can, uh, so we can take the four over the two as just a two, and we can take this part and this part out as their own fraction. Now, why would we do that? Well, this, you might recognize, is simply the reliability coefficient for y. So if we rewrite this as follows, we get the following formula. We get that the total reliability, rho x, x bar, is equal to two times the reliability of the parallel form, right, the shortened part, the half, over one plus that reliability coefficient. Now, what does this help us with? Well, it helps us in the following situation. Let me give you an example. Okay. First of all, let me just explicitly state what I was just asking. What this does is this formula allows us to compute the reliability by splitting the test into two parallel halves, y and y prime, and then simply computing the correlation between them. That's exactly what this is. It's the correlation between those two parallel halves. So if we want the, 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 the reliability coefficient of the whole form, split it into two halves, compute their correlation, and plug them into this formula. We'll see an example of how that works. So let's suppose that we observe a correlation between these two parallel halves that's pretty high. Let's say it's 0 0.90. What is the reliability of your test? So we're going to use this Spearman-Brown formula. Okay. Spearman-Brown formula, as we just learned, is two times the correlation between y and y prime over one plus that correlation. Now we know that correlation is 0.9. So let's replace each of these instances of this correlation coefficient with 0.9. Then it'll be two times 0.9 over one plus 0.9. Okay, so that's a fraction, that's 1.8 over 1.9, which simplifies to 0.95. So our reliability coefficient for the whole test it's found by doing this, by finding the, the correlation between the two split halves and then plugging them into the Spearman-Brown formula. Okay, So that's kind of nice. It's a nice way of doing things. However, it is limited. That's great, right? But Spearman-Brown only works if the two halves are parallel, right? The, the way the formula simplified and worked down was all based on that simplifying assumption. The next question, of course, is what happens if they're not parallel? Well, if they're not parallel, we, we have some work. So Cronbach figured this out in about 1950. If you don't have parallel forms, you can use this so-called alpha coefficient. And while it won't give you the exact uh, value of the reliability coefficient, it will give you a lower bound. So what that tells you is that your reliability is at least this alpha coefficient. What is the alpha coefficient? Well, let's just put it all out here. The alpha coefficient in words is up here. It's two times the covariance between the two halves over the total test variance, okay? Now, as a formula, you can think about it this way. Remember, covariance between the two halves is the stuff that's left over, basically, after you get rid of, um, uh, after you get rid of the components of variance from the subtests. Okay, um, so the way we can think about this is this is two times sigma squared x, the total variance, minus the sum of the variances from the components all over sigma squared x. Okay, so this is the formula that we're going to use. And again, this, this little greater than or equal to here, this is because alpha is a lower bound. Your reliability coefficient is always greater than or equal to whatever you get from alpha. So alpha is an estimate. It's not actually a com computation of the reliability coefficient. Let's see how it works. So 
So for example, let's suppose that you split a test into two halves. Now they don't have to be parallel. Uh, suppose you know that the variance of the first half is seven and the variance of the second half is five and that you know the total toast test variance is 17.9. Then what do we have? Okay. Well, let's use the, the alpha formula. So we know that the reliability is at least alpha, which is two times the total variance minus the sum of the half variances, right? So seven and five all over the total variance. So we can work that math out. Okay. Turns out that that's 0.66. So this, this alpha coefficient is the lower bound. It's the smallest value that your reliability coefficient could be. So this tells you that your test, in your test, the true scores account for at least 66% of the variability in the exam, which is okay, which is okay. Not, not great, but okay. Now we'll mention at this point that this form of Cronbach's alpha for using two halves can totally be extended to allow computation with item variances. So what that means is if you have a test of say 20 items, you don't have to split it into two tests. You can actually just look at the performance of each of the 20 items. And so this is actually the way that Cronbach's alpha is generally used. So if you have, uh, let's just say n items, right? So that we can handle any possible circumstance here, then the form for alpha is this. It's n over n minus one times the total variance minus the sum of the component variances. So in this case, these are the item variances all over the total variance. Let's see how this works in an example. So here's a real short example for us. Let's suppose that we have a test that's composed of three items, question one, question two, and question three. And let's suppose we've got five subjects here who uh, took that test. And I've also got the total score written out here. This is uh, 17 comes from five plus five plus seven. Similarly, this six comes from three plus two plus one, et cetera. So all of these are just the sums of the respective questions. Now to use Cronbach's alpha to find a lower bound on our reliability coefficient, we have to know the item variances and the total variance. So we would need to go through and compute the mean and then take the deviations from the mean, square them, add them up, find the average. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, so the item variances and the total variance turn out to be these values exactly. Okay, so this, it's just tedious, so I didn't wanna spend time on the video doing it. But once you get these, okay, then we can use our form uh, for Cronbach's alpha, and it looks like this. Okay, So Cronbach's alpha is n over n minus one. So in this case, that's three items over three minus one. And then it's multiplied by the total test variance, 45.3, you can see that here, minus the sum of the item variances, so that's these three added together, all again over the total variance. So we do our arithmetic, we sure we be sure to obey order of operations and do this first before subtracting. And that gives us the following, gives us three over two times 22.5 over 43.5, which if we do that arithmetic, gives us a reliability coefficient of 0.75. This is the smallest uh, possible value for our reliability coefficient. We are we have at least 74.5% of the variance accounted for by true scores. And that's how you do Cronbach's alpha. Now, computer software packages like JASP or whatever you might use will do this for you uh, for very large data sets. And at some point this semester, we will certainly uh, investigate that. Now, I do want to end today with one more uh, extension of these things that we've learned today, namely the Spearman-Brown formula, to talk about what happens to reliability when we make tests longer or shorter. So it's very common, you, you, can, you can get an estimate of reliability from Cronbach's alpha. It works for, for anything. You don't have to worry about parallel forms. Uh, it's really, really a nice technique. But let's suppose that you find that your test is not that reliable. The reliability is only maybe 0.6 or 0.5 or something like that. Um, how could you make it more reliable? Uh, would you add more items? Would you add smaller items? I mean, not smaller, but uh, fewer items. So to answer this question, we really need to think about what happens to reliability when we add more items or take them away. And we can investigate that using the Spearman-Brown formula. 
So let's recall that the Spearman-Brown formula for two halves looks like this. The reliability is equal to two times the correlation between the halves over one plus the correlation. Now, just like Cronbach's alpha, it turns out that you can scale this notion up to n parallel halves. Like if you have n copies of the test nested within the test itself, you get this generalized Spearman-Brown formula. And the generalization is really quite nice. You simply replace the two with the number of parallel forms, so n, and then you put a coefficient in front of this guy that's just equal to n minus one. So there's that whole n over n minus one thing floating around again. So this is a generalized Spearman-Brown formula. This turns out to be very useful. I'll give you one example of how it is useful. Let's suppose that we have a five item test with an estimated reliability of 0.6. What would happen to the reliability if we made the test three times longer, so 15 items? Well, this is a perfect kind of question to apply the generalized Spearman-Brown formula to. Let's see how that would work. So generalized Spearman-Brown, remember is, let's get them both in the same frame here, here we go, is n times the correlation uh, over uh, one plus n minus one times the correlation. So since you're using n copies of this thing, you know that its reliability coefficient is 0 0.6. We're gonna put that here. Okay. So this will be three times that reliability coefficient of 0 0.6 over one plus three minus one times that same reliability coefficient. And now we just do the arithmetic. We get 1.8 on top, we get 2.2 on the bottom, and now we can see that our reliability coefficient goes from 0 0.6 for the small form up to 0.82 for the one that's three times longer. So you can see adding more items does seem to uh, increase our reliability. And in fact, it increases it over that uh, magical threshold of 0.8, which is often used as a target when thinking about reliability coefficients. So think about yourself as a test user. Would you want to use the five item test or would you want to use the 15 item test? Well, to answer that, think about what would this mean for a reliability coefficient versus this? And the answer is, this is, gonna, this is telling you that the 15 item test accounts for 82%, uh, or sorry, that the in the 15 item test, the true score variability is 82% of your total variability, whereas in the five item test, it's only 60%. This is certainly better, certainly better. And as we saw in the last unit, this means we're gonna have less measurement error, so certainly you would want to use the five item test. Now the sky's the limit, right? Think about this, you could just keep adding and make it a 20 item, a 25 item all the way up, but at some point your return on investment is gonna be a little bit low. Uh, so you might not get that much improvement in the reliability coefficient for the extra five items. So at what point do you stop? That would be a good investigation for a student who wanted to do an honors project or something. So if that's you, be sure and let me know. Okay, so that's it today. The main thing that we wanted to cover was some ways to actually get estimation of reliability. And the, the short answer is use Cronbach's alpha. It doesn't give you an exact reliability coefficient because it relaxes the parallel forms um, assumption, but it does give you a good lower bound. So you know your reliability is at least as good as the value, value that you get from Cronbach's alpha. And then we've used the Spearman-Brown and the generalized Spearman-Brown formula to talk about what happens when you uh, make tests longer. And you can do the same kind of idea when tests are shorter. So that's all for today, uh, and we'll see you at the next lecture.